Brilliant. Um, I, I forgot to kind of introduce myself. I'm Chris. I'm one of the other uh, elders or pastors at Kings. If you don't know me, uh, kind of oversee our small groups um, and uh, oversee our student team and things like that. So I have a bit of involvement in our pastoral structures at Kings and obviously just helping people on an individual basis a- across the church as well. And I'm going to just ask Rob to come and, and, and join. I'm going to sit in the Michael Parkinson chair for this bit, which I'm kind of excited about. Um, but just, I think we're hoping to spend the next little while just talking a little bit more about how we as a church have pastoral, should I give you that one? Um, how we have pastoral structures that help us as a church. Um, how do we care for people with mental health challenges as we encounter that in church life? Um, and hopefully we'll just spend a little bit of time chatting about pastoral care in a church setting. Um, and then we'll probably have just a, a moment of pause before we bring a couple of more people up on stage and we can go through some of the questions on Slido. So I'm just looking at the time now, trying to figure out how much time we probably have for this. Good. All right. Just by way of introduction, I guess like any church, we want to create an environment where everyone coming into contact with us is getting great care, that there is a culture of care right across our church that looks after everyone, particularly people with mental health challenges, which would be many people in in church life. That's a simple thing to say and a really hard thing to do well, as I think we've kind of already realized today. And I think in in our church, speaking for Kings, our our emphasis is on kind of the ministry of the body, like we would read about in Ephesians 4 or 1 Corinthians 12, in terms of every one of us working together to care for one another, and rather than that sort of uh, single pastor doing all the caring or relying on a a professional sort of priest or clerical hierarchy to, to do things. So our pastoral structures at Kings and in churches like ours are, are pretty decentralized. And I think that means that for me as a pastor, I am rarely the first port of call for somebody who's needing or asking for help. Um, often that's going to be their friends or small group leaders like, like many of you are, or it's going to be people they're serving alongside on a Sunday, or just people in particularly public-facing roles like our welcome team or connect team on a Sunday or something like that. So pastoral care in our church and in in churches like ours involves loads and loads and loads of people, which is wonderful, but it means that there are obvious challenges with creating pastoral structures and uh, simple pastoral systems kind of are hard to create. One of the things we've been doing recently at King's that we've been chatting with Rob a bit about is we've been trying to draw up uh, a pastoral care uh, policy, if you like. But because of the complexities involved, like as we've found already this morning and as, we've, as I've just talked about, it's taking a while to finalize. And uh, we're aware that it's really important to have policies like that in place because as we continue to grow as a church, we want everyone to be well equipped to care for one another. We want small group leaders to feel released to care for people that they're coming into contact with and know what to do in facing complex situations. But it's, uh, I think we need to remember, Chris, the work that Chris has put into this. It's a bit like painting the fourth bridge, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you sort of, you work through That's it and you make changes and tweaks, and then you get to the end, you realize you need to go back to the beginning and kind of tweak and adjust everything. So we're on Definitely. version six. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably, Still not ready for probably m- much more than that. And then I got <laughs> Rob's really helpful take on it. I was like, more work needed. So I think, yeah, that's more work, more work needed to be done here. And I guess, Rob, I want to get your take on just some principles that we should be thinking through as we care for people so that we can have good pastoral care policies as churches and represented here in the room, but also so each of us are really well equipped just in caring for our brothers and sisters. So, Rob, shall we start with, I think we were going to start with caring for one another, weren't we? I think there's just want to ask you about the kind of normal everyday caring for one another that goes on within church life obviously new testament is just full of 
direct commands of what we should be, how we should be relating to one another. And most of the pastoral care that goes on in our churches is, is, is like that. So what are the things we need to bear in mind as we just are encountering one another in that one anothering everyday contact pastoral care? Totally. And I, th- I think, you know, if you think about it a bit like, you know, your, your, your fire policy, you know, you, 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 hopefully you never have to use your fire policy. And if you do, there's a really important section in the fire policy that explains how you're going to evacuate people. But actually, most of what's in the fire policy is once every six months, we're going to go around and check the fire hydrants. We're going to make sure that we've got the right kind of doors, et cetera, et cetera. So it's stuff that's kind of built in. And I think that's where you should be with a pastoral care policy. Yes, there are terms we might get onto, like safeguarding and adult protection and child protection and that sort of thing. But actually, the vast majority of it is just... It's just, it's just being with people. And I, I think, actually, the, the, the testimony we heard from Sarah is, is a great example um, of just sort of working alongside someone, working, working through someone. This is everyday life. And I think sometimes, I can't remember who asked the chap there who asked about, you know, we're all squeaky clean. You know, we think everyday life is, um, you know, the upward call of God in Christ as though it's like a sort of aeroplane taking off and, and going up. No, 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 it's more like sort of, you know, and then you sort of reverse a bit and then you regress and then you hit the wall and try and go around and you can't, so you've got to go through. And I mean, normal spiritual growth is um, lived, lived in the everyday, the rough and tumble of, of life. And I think that's where, that's where we need to be sort of vulnerable and also to a certain extent trust in in our competencies just to be. There's a slide, Janice, if we can, the slide that is it's called Life Together. Um, if you want to sort of dig into um, church life in this kind of way, so Dietrich Bonhoeffer, some of you might know the name, he was a, a Lutheran pastor who was imprisoned and ultimately killed by, by Hitler during World War II. And he says this about Life Together, the person who loves their dream of community, as in they're raising up the idol of community, will destroy community, but the person who loves those around them will create community. And one of the reasons for that is I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray, no matter how much trouble he causes me. And that's one of the things that I sometimes deal with in the NHS. You know, if it, I'll get a referral in from someone who I don't know, and it's like, here, responsibility, take it over there. And actually, one of the things I'll sometimes do is pick up the phone and speak to them, or even better, actually, just meet them and talk to them. And actually, when you look at someone, you see Jesus staring back at you. And I think, you know, if, if we can bring those kinds of things in, that actually we, we, we do life together, we, we have to pray for each other. And this lovely one here, in, in the presence of a psychiatrist, I can only be a, saint, a sick man. In the presence of a Christian brother, I can dare to be a sinner. I can, I can dare to ask for forgiveness. So there's something, there's something very special about Christian community. And I don't want to sort of say that, you know, a Christian community is like better than normal community. But actually, I think it is. Um, I'm sorry, I'll be completely honest with that. I do think it's better, um, as long as we don't over-spiritualise it and forget that actually quite a lot of this is just being friends with people, just helping, very practical stuff. You know, Sarah was saying that actually what's really helpful is when people bought her food and clothes. That's probably more helpful than six Bible verses. Um, You know, so be practical, just trust in your own skills. First of all, just to love people, and love people, not what you get back, because actually you get that back anyway. If you love, you get it back anyway. And, um, and also just trust in that ability just, just, just to pray healing and, and, and forgiveness, because that's something that we can all do for each other. You don't need to be a, a reverend, you know, to, to do that. We, 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 we can all do that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, how, how do you think we... I suppose there's two extreme ways we can respond as we're engaging with with people. We can kind of get, we can kind of go into amateur psychoanalyst mode on the on the one extreme, or we can like hear the term mental health and just kind of get freaked out and think that we have nothing nothing to offer and I have no idea what to do. How do we just make sure that we're constantly not falling into those extremes? Yeah, I think. I think, you know, the, the, part of it comes down to that we all, we all have mental health. You know, we, we've all got this. And if you, if you don't think you've got it, then actually that's the person who's sort of, um, you know, there's, there's a lovely, there's a lovely um, Brené Brown cry. I won't get the slide up, but it just says, um, um, those who get angry 
when you set a boundary are the ones with whom you need to set boundaries. Um, and you know, so I think I think we 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 can all we can all do this so well together. Um, I think I think a lot of it is just remembering that we're all in this journey together. That you know the, 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 that that division between sane and insane that I mentioned earlier, you know, and yeah, sure, there's some types of mental illness that are more obvious, but actually many of them are invisible. You know, I've already heard how Sarah has spoken to a number of people in, in, in this church who um, take medication that actually no one knew about. So I think it, we, we don't need to, to be the psychoanalyst. So part of that is making sure that you've got access to those people. Yeah. And um, there are good counsellors out there, Christian ones, non-Christian ones, you'll perhaps talk about that later. There are people who have got that training. Um, but actually, the most helpful thing you can do is, um, first of all, practical stuff. A bunch of us are going to the cinema. Do you want to come? Um, you know, that's probably more helpful than, than any, any, anything else. It's the really kind of practical stuff that's good. And then the other thing, perhaps, is not putting your foot in it and saying to someone who's been a, been a Christian for 10 years, have you thought about reading your Bible? She's like, uh, yes. Um, you know, uh, so I think, you know, not, perhaps not, so, uh, one of the articles we've got on the Minosol website is, um, it's called 16 Things Not to Say. And that's one of them. And actually, if you think about it, it's just like, oh, why on earth did I say that? No, that's, 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 that's really good. I'm sure there's a few of us who've been in those uh, situations, said the wrong thing, and that's, that's okay. We're learning, growing, and getting better. I think one thing... I know a lot of Christians, uh, a lot of people in the room will, will struggle with is boundaries. You just kind of mentioned that word. Obviously, as followers of Jesus, we're called, aren't we, to, to lay our lives down for one another and to serve in, in, a, in a costly way. But at the same time, helping other people can be really demanding um, in the church setting as well. And there's obviously a risk that we burn out. Um, how can we... How can we support other people, particularly people just struggling with some mental health issues that we might not fully understand in a healthy and sustainable way? So say, say there's just somebody, somebody who you're getting alongside who just seems to want more from you than you can kind of give. Maybe they want to come around to your house regularly and, 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 and you're just like, I'm not sure I can... Not sure me or my family can quite sustain this, or maybe it's just phone calls increasing. Often I think these things are hard to, to know what to do with because they are gradual in, yeah. in nature. So it might be that somebody starts phoning you for support, and that's really helpful, and there's good reasons you're having good chats, and then maybe those phone calls get increasing in length, yeah. and it's quite hard to know how to manage that. What would your advice yeah. be? I think, I think you touched on probably the key thing there, which is you said... And I'm starting to find it really hard to cope with this level of, of, of ask. So I think when, when you're putting a boundary in place, it's really important to do it from your perspective. So sometimes, you know, we I think about, you know, young children, for example. It's good for them that they only have half an hour of YouTube a day. Now, that, that may be true, but um, that's not the way to do boundaries with adults. You know, it's, it's not good for you to become too dependent on me. Don't, don't say that. Um, that may come up in discussion, which is perhaps they need to have a wider support network. But you don't say, it's not good for you to become dependent. What you do is you say, I, I can't sustain this. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. I want to make time with you, but I'm struggling to sustain this. And actually, I, I, for my own reasons, I need to spend time with my family. I need to spend time doing nothing. You know, and it's beginning to... So what you're doing is you're answering from the first person. Yeah. And... The other sort of tip that's related to that is sometimes we just need to say no. Um, the problem is there's some people who've never been told no. And also, as Christians, we can sometimes think that um, we should never say no. Because, I mean, Jesus died on the cross. You know, he never said no for me, did he? So, so I should always say, say yes. I should always make myself. Um, and there is a verse in, in Romans, um, spend yourself on yeah. behalf of the needy, but... Also in Romans, it says God desires living sacrifices, not burnt offerings. Okay, so, so I think we, we need to sort of get that balance. You know, there, there will be, there is a cost yeah. to the Christian life, and we will spend ourselves on behalf of the needy, but it's like that sort of C.S. Lewis thing I was saying earlier with 25 in the church and 25 new come in. You will spend some of your spiritual potential capacity on, on them, but not to the point where 
either you're a burnt offering and going into burnout or where you're reacting immaturely and you're beginning to dominate or control or all those sort of characteristics you don't like about yourself start, start coming out. You know, those are some of the sort of warning signs. So, mm. so a good tip I sometimes talk about is the sort of yes, no, yes sandwich. Okay, so this is yes, I see the need. I totally understand why you're wanting to come around. You're not invalidating that. I see that. No, at this moment in my life, I cannot do it to the level you want. But yes, I would like to work with you to find out how we can get that need met in other ways. Um, so it's that sort of yes, no, yes kind of thing. And again, um, just we'll, we'll send these slides around, but if we can pop the boundaries slide up. I can't read this at all, and I can't read that either. Um, <laughs> So what have we got? Yeah, that's you know, nice and big up there, isn't it? This again is from, from Mercy U, U, UK, uh, who that video was of just, just after lunch. So boundaries may sound like, let me come back to you on that. I can't help, or I can help, but I won't do this. There's a song about that, isn't there? <laughs> but I won't, no. Um, but, <laughs> but the, 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 you know, I, I can help, but I'm not going to pick you up from the shops every week. Um, but I, I will maybe, you know, find some other way to do that. Um, I'm not okay with being spoken to like that. that. That's unacceptable. In the same way that we were sort of talking earlier that some behaviours in church on Sunday are, are, are not acceptable. So I think, you know, th there's, there's a variety of different things that boundaries may look like. And um, the, the classic book by um, Cloud and Townsend on boundaries um, is probably the one to, to recommend for that, particularly if you're someone who, who really struggles with, with boundaries. It's a really helpful practical kind of book, but that sort of yes, no, yes sandwich and always speak from your position. Mm. No, that's, that's helpful. I, I think it's a conversation I am often having <coughs> with, with people leading in some capacity in, in, in church, just that I, I'm, people are doing it because they love people. And, and, it's, and it's really, it's like, I want to love people. I want to love people, so I have to do this, right? It's like, yeah. no, actually, it, that doesn't always mean you have to do that. And mm -hmm. just really such an important issue. I think on a similar note, um, sometimes when, when mental illness is involved, it can be hard to know how urgent things are. If sort of from the outside, I think often if somebody is coming to you and asking for help, it's often presenting as quite urgent in that moment. Um, people tend to have kind of built up to asking for help, so it, it feels very urgent in that moment because they're finally finally getting to ask for help. How do you discern um, sort of how urgent something is and therefore how you should be responding yeah. to someone? So I think probably the, the first thing to say is that today's session does not make you trained mental health professionals. You know, your job at the end of today is not to be able to do a risk assessment and, and make decisions based on all that kind of stuff. Um, your, your job is just to be a little bit more informed, so perhaps we don't repeat some of the mistakes of history and we've begun to, to think this through as a church. So, so I think probably the first thing to say is that I don't know if discernment is too complex a word. I probably would go with the hairs on the back of your neck. Mm. And, and what I mean by that is if, if you're worried, act. You know, and, um, you know, you, I heard this story in, in, um, in America of someone who got sued for doing sort of CPR, basic life support on someone. And, um, and, you know, it's just like, well, but I just had to do it. You know, you collapse in front of me. I wasn't going to do nothing, was I? And, and likewise, you know, um, I've, I've sort of worked with, with patients over time who, you know, they've, they've said things over the phone or on a, a video consultation. And, and what, what I've done is I've phoned the police. And the reason I've phoned the police is I've been really worried about them because they told me they were going to end the call and go and do X. And I phoned the police. And they said, why did you phone the police? I said, well, because you said that. Um, you know, and I think, so what I did was I, I erred on the side of caution. And I think what I would say is, you know, if, if you're really worried about someone, do something. Okay, you, you know, say, look, I'm, I, I, I don't know if I can leave you. Um, can, we, can we go down to a &E? Can we go down the Royal Ed to M House? Can we phone 111 and I'll, I'll sit with you while you, you, you phone up? So if you're really worried about it, go with the hairs on the back of your head because we would never teach anybody to do anything different. Um, if you keep finding yourself in, in that situation with that person, and it always seems to be urgent in this particular situation, I think that's a good time when you maybe want to work alongside mental health services. So hopefully that person is in touch with mental health services, and there's absolutely no problem with you going along to an appointment 
Now, sure, they're going to want to talk to the person one-to-one -to, -one to a certain extent, but I always prefer it when someone turns up with other people, be it friends or family or something. But the vast majority of it, it's actually not in that sort of category. There are, there are times to escalate, but the vast majority of time, it's, it's maybe thinking of, sort of those creative kind of middle ways. So rather than, oh, that was an interesting chat over coffee, wasn't it? Right, I'll see you next week. Um, and you, you sort of wait till next Sunday. It's like, we, it sounds like we, we um, spoke about some really heavy stuff then. Would it be helpful if I maybe just texted you tomorrow to see how you are? Um, so you're responding in a sort of urgent way, but you're not overreacting, if that makes sense. You say, you know, how are you going to be between now and, and next week? Could, would you like to meet? You know, I, 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 I'm really busy on Monday, but I'd love to meet with you on Tuesday. I've got a bit of time. So you're trying to sort of respond in an appropriate time scale in a way that suits your boundaries. Because most of the time, we don't need to phone 111 or or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the big issues in um, pastoral care in church that I hear getting talked about a lot is, is confidentiality and, and what role that has to play and how much we should be sharing information. When should we be sharing information? Sometimes that can be really hard to know. I think often there's a tension, isn't there? On the one hand, you, you kind of want to promise some sort of confidentiality to somebody because you're looking to make them feel safe and you're hoping that they can share some more with you in that in that way and kind of on the other hand you're aware that you need to be accountable as you're caring for other people and you might need to get other people involved particularly as it was a really serious situation what would what would you say generally to that i've got a couple of scenarios could talk about at some point, but yeah, I think I think you know the, the norm should be an assumption of confidentiality. So I think you know if if you say to someone, particularly if you start your conversation with, "I don't want this to go any further," that should mean it doesn't go any further. You don't share it for prayer on the church gossip train, you know. So I think when when you say, "I don't want this to go any further," with the exception of a couple of content areas, that that should be. You, you just don't share. It's not your information. It, it's their information. If, if you don't want to hear that, then it's, it's up to you to say at that point, I'm not sure I want you to tell me that um, because either I've got such a blabber mouth that I don't trust myself or um, can you tell me about it in really small stages because I'm feeling a bit fragile myself at the moment. So again, you're putting your, your, your boundaries there. But if, if someone tells you something in confidence, then it's in confidence, that, that's the bottom line. Um, the times when it does need to go a little bit further are um, probably a couple of, couple of situations. One is, I suppose, the risk area, mm -hmm. where if there's significant risk to that person or another person, or if it's a, a child under 18, then there does need to be a degree of communication. But emphasis the word significant risk. It's not just... Um, theoretical risk or imagined risk. It's got to be, you know, significant risk. There are situations where we do have to share, particularly with child protection, we'll perhaps come back to in a second. Um, the other thing situation, and we were sort of, when we were sort of planning the pastoral care policy, we were looking at these various different levels. And mm. there, there is a level where you, you don't have to share with the church safeguarding coordinator, let's say. It's nowhere near that. But not talking to your small group leader or, or, or your locality hub, hub leader may mean that you can't help as much as you want to. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, to make a theoretical, let's suppose someone's got a fairly serious drink problem, okay? That's for them to deal with. They've told you, they've told you it shouldn't go any further, and you say, okay, that's fine, I'm not gonna tell anyone. And it's, it's not actually causing harm to anyone else, but there may be situations where um, that might mean that they're not able to get involved in certain parts of church life because they're, they're not willing to share and not willing to, to, to deal with it. So it's not at the sort of legal sharing level, but it's at the practical. This, this will impact how much we can help you because I know that drink is always an issue and actually we can't help in this way until you've got more of a handle on the drink problem. 
What would you say if there's a situation where something's been disclosed to you by somebody who's saying, hey, you know, I've got this kind of issue going on for me, and they, over a period of a few months, you kind of see that they're also going to a lot of other people in church life for assistance, whether it's like, you know, financial assistance or whatever. And it's kind of one of those pastoral situations where you just see it getting for want of a better phrase, I guess, out of hand. Mm -hmm. Like things are just, it's kind of growing arms and legs a bit. It's impacting more and more people in church. And you're like, I kind of know why that's happening because I've, they've disclosed something really key to me. And now it's beginning to spread out a bit in church life. How would you kind of advise? People are burning out sequential People yeah, is, is a lot of other people about. are getting tugged yeah. in. It's, it's doing yeah. them no good at all. And, and I think that's you know a good example of perhaps when something would have to be shared, not not for legal reasons, and it needs to, to stay confidential um, within church. But actually, you, you you do need to share that in a a forum that kind of encompasses the whole church. And we we were discussing a little bit about what that group is. You know, is that the full eldership, or is it just the hub leaders, um, or is it some sort of pastoral care group that maybe draws in people with special skills. There's, there's no right or wrong answer to that. What, what I would say is it needs to be proportional. Yeah. So if it's more a matter of keeping a gentle eye on things and um, just sort of noticing that so-and-so seems to be spending more time with a new person, you might want to sort of gently pick up on that and, and possibly approach them, them directly and say, oh, we've noticed this behaviour. Um, I think if it's more sort of literally it's happening in a completely uncontrolled way, that probably is a situation where you actually do need to be sharing this among the small group leaders and say, we have this situation. I'm not going to tell you the details. I don't need to know you anymore. But I think for the safety of everyone else, the mental health of everyone else in the church, we need to be quite strict about the number of people who support that person. And if you see one of your group trying to support this person, please say to them, don't do this. I don't need to know any more details than that, yeah. but it's like we're having to handle it this way because we've seen this, 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 this pattern of behaviour. So you're, you're, you're aware of it and you're, you're acting on it, but you, you don't have to share details. You don't need to know why it is. People don't need to know whether it's something from their past or uh, substance misuse or some ongoing criminal investigation. You know, the, people don't need, to know that sort of, don't need to know that sort of detail. But I think it's a good example where actually you do need a pastoral care policy and it actually needs to have teeth. Because otherwise it's just a policy that sits on the shelf, isn't it? Um, So I think there's going to be times, and these are fairly rare, you know, I expect this to happen like once a year max, maybe once every two or three years, you know. (laughs) But it it will happen. You know, I've I've seen this happen a handful of times, certainly, where actually something should have been done and something wasn't done and it just kind of carried on. Yeah. That's really helpful, Rob. I think... um, Something in my experience that's, that, that can be challenging if you're walking alongside people kind of closely, day in, day out, it can be kind of hard to know when their situation is actually getting worse and some kind of escalation needs to go on. I know, you know people could be dealing with something kind of on a fairly flat line for a while, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, something is not quite right here. Mm-hmm you kind of get that, that feeling mm. all of a sudden that it's maybe not going particularly well and you find yourself concerned for somebody. So what, how, what, would your, what would you say about escalating things? Whether it's obviously other people in church, we've touched on that a little bit, but maybe more the sort of healthcare professional kind of side of things. Yeah, I, I think it, it kind of depends how quickly it's going downhill. So um, one of the sort of mantras is um, don't just sit there, do something. But... Any psychotherapist worth their salt will tell you, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so I think there's, there's a point at which we want to not react, and we actually want to just have a wee think about it, maybe talk to one other person about it. So don't overreact. Mm. Um, you know, a, a, a good example is maybe someone has spoken about self-harm for the first time. Yeah. We know that's been going on for months. And actually, they've taken them loads of time to pluck up the courage to talk about it. And now they've spoken about it. The last thing you want to do is go, you know, sort of press the panic button and so completely overreact. Because actually, what's perfectly acceptable in that situation is to say, that was quite, quite heavy. Um, would you like to meet 
meet maybe later on this week and or we can just go for a walk or something like that. You know, so you want to sort of, as long as it's not like major risks or it's not into that legal territory, you, you want to sort of just, don't just do something, sit there. But I think this is where it's really helpful to have someone else who you can talk to. And it could be that you talk to your spouse or something, um, or, um, you know, there is maybe some, a, a group in the church who, you know, you can say, we've been doing this and it's been fine and we've been meeting up and it's all fine. Now this has happened, what do you think I should do? So I think that's probably a, and you don't need to mention any names, um, just to have people who you can maybe sort of bounce a couple of, a couple of things off. Yeah, I think that's such a good point about having support as, as leaders and when we're looking to walk alongside other people and support them, it's so important not to neglect supporting yourself in that and, and, and making sure that you do have people you can, can chat to mm. and, and can advise you. Lisa, do you want to come and, and join us up on stage just um, for a moment? Lisa is, um, obviously, as loads of you know, our administrator here at King's, also um, currently studying for a counselling diploma. In, in Parkinson, he moves down. Yes, that's and right. And she it takes the way, hot seat. And then you, you take see. The, the next. That's right. Yeah. Glad you've seen Eye contact, you know. <laughs> um, I, I know Lisa is somebody who is really passionate about supporting people going through uh, mental health challenges. And you have written, you're a, a, a published author, Lisa, today. Oh, can I see, you've guys. written a, a really brilliant little book that I know lots of you all have picked it up at the, the book stall. It's called Being a Friend to Somebody Struggling with Mental Health, Caring for Yourself and Those You Love. So I think we printed maybe 25 copies off for people to take away. Um, if you didn't manage to get one of those and you want a digital copy, just leave your email address and we can send one on. I'd really recommend it. Just really simple, really practical advice that Lisa's um, kind of taken from her experience um, and also some of your, your studies as well. Lisa, with your experience, obviously drawing from, from things you've been learning um, about counseling, what advice would you have on supporting people around us who are struggling, obviously struggling with their mental health? Um, hello. Don't see me here often. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I have been studying counselling for three years now, so I've got a year left, but um, we're getting there. The slog is almost over. Um, it is good, highly recommend. Um, but yeah, I started studying counselling just mainly out of like, care and compassion for people. Um, and I had some mental health crisis seasons in my family and um, I struggled myself too and it just helped me to go to counselling. Um, I know that it's hard if you don't have a great experience um, but for me um, it really impacted me and um, I wanted to offer it to others. Um, so yeah, I think something that I've um, taken that I sort of uh, I think is very transferable. Um, it's just to be able to listen well. Um, and I think like we find, or I don't know, we listen every day, I guess, we hear things every day. Um, but I think it can be really hard um, not to sort of really, I think like really listening to someone's story, um, to not get distracted by a shopping list or um, as well, I think I struggle like to not bring it back to myself. Um, be like, oh yeah, I, I know a story. Let me just go off on that and just tell you about myself for 15 minutes. <laughs> um, especially if someone is opening up to you for the first time. That's, yeah, it, if you actually pay attention to that and notice how many times you do that, it's quite um, eye-opening, or it was for me. Um, and yeah, just responding empathetically and to their how they're feeling. Um, I think as well, like noticing, something I noticed is how like I respond to people. So things that people say and how like my body language will change or um, I'll be like, oh, whoa. And um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I found that often people have continued to share with me because I'm not reacting. I'm just like, whatever you say to me, I'm gonna respond in the same way. Um, and uh, yeah, I think sometimes it can shut down future sharing if you do react. Like, I don't know. I guess it's important to um, notice how we're uh, feeling and create those boundaries. But in the moment, I think it's helpful not to 
react overly, maybe just as you were saying, we're overreacting. Um, as well, I think, um, not immediately going into fix it mode, like often, um, as we've heard, like these things can be going on for a while and it's not something that can just immediately be fixed and also they probably know that, like they've thought of all of the things and this maybe is not helping. Um, and actually they just want, as a friend, they just want you to be, they just want you to hear them and to be heard. Um, I think sometimes if we're fixing things, it can maybe also be a representation of how we're coping. So um, are we fixing things for their sake or ours? Yeah. Um, and open questions, love an open question. We do love an open question. <laughs> if anybody knows <laughs> me, anytime someone asks a closed question, that was a bit, that was a bit direct now, wasn't it? <laughs> um. <laughs> we get critiqued in the office about our open questions. Yeah, maybe a bit too much. <laughs> no, but I feel like you're learning. I think I am. Yeah. I think I am. Mm, thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, like, yes, no questions. They just shut the door, really. Or they could just show that you're not actually interested, that you just want them to say yes and no, and that you don't want to hear their full heart. Um, and sometimes we don't realise that. Um, and Or we put our opinions on them. So don't you think this? And they're like, well, well I don't think that. So um, that can sort of invalidate and make them make people feel like what they're thinking isn't valid. Um, and yeah, I think I just try and leave the door open. I say thank you for sharing. Um, I really valued your openness and I'm here if you want to talk again. Um, and those things have helped me to be a friend to people. Um, and I just have an example. Yeah. Um, sure. uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was just thinking about this, and um, I became aware of someone who uh, used to come to Kingston now um, that was just really struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts and behaviours, and I just befriended her. Um, I don't know, I must have spoken to her or messaged her, but um, we had dinner together maybe every fortnight. Um, and I'd just go to her place every time and we'd cook or and talk about how she was feeling if she wanted to or not. Um, and she said afterwards when she was doing better that she didn't know how she would be here if it wasn't for our dinners. Um, and it just always stuck with me how much that that impacted her. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, sorry. Um, I think... I was just trying to be a good friend, but God used me in that season to bless her. Um, and I think that that sort of worked because um, I was able to do something that was manageable for me. So I had boundaries every two weeks seemed like I can do that. Mm. Um, I didn't forget about her when she was when it was maybe more long term. Um, I was consistent, and um, I gave a space for her to talk. And um, I could also check that she was still, you know, going to various external support. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think that that resource that Chris mentioned that is where these things have stemmed from. Um, and hopefully, it's. Helpful. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. There you go. That's that is me. Yeah, that's it for Thank you. I think, I think you make a really good point there about um, there's some things you were learning as a counsellor, but you were already doing them as a friend. Yeah. So you, you were sort of yeah. consistent. You were not reacting. You were just sort of holding and, and, and being and um, having that, you know, that unconditional positive regard. I spoke about able to hold things. Now, Yes, those things can be developed into the full counselling model where perhaps you have more boundaries because you're in a counselling yeah. centre and you are more trained, therefore you're able to hold more difficult situations. But these are things that we can, we can all do. You know, we can all show that, that empathy, yeah. for want of a better term, you know, rather than give advice, respond, re react. And I was thinking, well, do a few more questions in a second, Chris, but why don't, why don't we watch that Brené yeah, Brown video be clip? Because that, that really illustrate, illustrates the difference between empathy and sympathy. And you might think sympathy is a positive word, 
Watch this clip and still th see if you think sympathy is a positive word at the end of this clip. <gasps> So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Some of it, some of it is personality, though. I think, I think yeah. we need to be honest here. Some of it is personality and gifting. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's trying to get that sort of. There's some stuff we need to work at. You know, we all need to keep physically fit because mm. um, if we don't, we're going to get sick and moribund and words like that. And um, you know, we need to work at our empathic skills, otherwise we're going to hurt people. Yeah. But a bit like being an evangelist, there's some people who are better at it than other people. You know, so I think we need not to sort of give ourselves a hard time, because that wouldn't be empathic. Mm, no, it's the truth. At least I haven't been that rude. Um, but, but, you know, acknowledge that we probably do need to be em, em, empathic. And I think a good example is, um, you know, in your close relationship, like a marriage relationship, you, you just have to be empathic in marriage or else it won't last. Mm. You can't be the one with the solutions the whole time, because that just creates an, um, a, a power dynamic, doesn't it? Um, but... Are you naturally skilled and called to take this further? Potentially, that's not your primary gifting, shall we say. In the same way, some people are not called to sing from the front of church. Um, <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's okay to be different, but I think probably a bit, a bit of graft there, and hopefully that sort of video sort of illustrated where work might need to be done in some areas. Can I say, and practice. Practice and being comfortable with the silence, because when somebody's sharing something that's really difficult... You know, we all want to jump in and you feel uncomfortable waiting and being a silent, but hey, they're feeling uncomfortable sharing something really personal and difficult to you. So a little bit of discomfort of just, okay, maybe the best thing to do is be quiet. I'm mm. no expert. I'm a terrible at jumping in. You can pass the microphone on now because she's answered one. <laughs> <laughs> That's you done. <laughs> Um, I would just say that it's probably hard to be empathetic if you aren't like 
uh, I don't know, if you aren't being reflective yourself and um, I think if you are closed or don't often share, it's going to be hard to listen to other people and that be in any way helpful. Um, yeah. mm. I think there's a general point in this, isn't there, obviously, that we can be quite like, you know, personality types and giftings, even within church and stuff like that. And they can be very useful for self-awareness, but they can be very unhelpful for creating illegitimate boundaries. Be like, I'm just a talker. Like, okay, well, you need to then shut up. Like, because <laughs> otherwise you can't be friends with people and you can't care for it. And, and so I think sometimes we say we put ourselves at, like either someone's super gifted and super amazing at it or nothing at all. And I think for most of us, there's a place in that in between there that days like this should be helping us with like right, I really need to learn how to be quiet or I really need to push into that more not because I'm going to become like a world expert or become a counsellor or something but because I want to care for people and and so I think it's very important that we don't cut ourselves off from from the, like the, the normal day to day yeah. caring for one another which I think we're getting real good help from well, I think we, we, we change over time so you know mm. if you contrast the tone of 1 Corinthians with to Corinthians, you see that empathy and willingness to tolerate suffering coming in Paul. And it's actually his third letter because we lost the middle one. So there's quite a long time in between those two letters. And, you, you know, you can see a difference in tone. So there's hope for us all. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go through some general questions uh, that we'll pick up from different bits of the day and different people might have things to say. Um, so a number of questions about, um, I guess, kind of, uh, particularly therapy um, and, and I, I guess some forms of, of, of help with mental health that Christians should be either aware of, wary of, things they should avoid or, or, or just be okay about. Um, I think I've expressed that not helpfully, but um, yeah. Uh, do you know what I'm asking you, Lisa? I have a thought. I'd love to hear it. Okay. <laughs> um, I think something, well, so in in my counselling training, I'm, I'm not doing Christian counselling. or um, It's not like a specific Christian uh, counselling course. Um, so I do learn the sort of, it's like the three psychodynamic CBT. So psychodynamic is like your past impacts, you use CBT, lots of like tools and behavioural changes and stuff like that. And then person-centred, which is like the all about you one, which I... Like, person-centred is naturally what I am gravitating towards because it's sort of how, uh, like, empathising and unconditional positive regard and stuff like that. But I do struggle with the, um, like, it's your truth and how you feel. Um, so one thing I would say about, about that is, as well that I'm sort of thinking about is that the counsellor should be seeing it from your frame of reference. So if your frame of reference is that you believe in God and... Uh, you know, your answers come from him, then I'm sort of, if, I was, uh, if I'm the client, then I'm sort of encouraged by that they're there for you and what helps you. So if that's where you're coming from, then they should be coming from that frame of reference, if that helps in any way, mm -hmm. shape or form. And I think also, you know, if you do do a secular qualification, it means that you can work in a school or um, do all kinds of different things. So my wife's doing a counselling course at the moment. It's, um, it leads to a secular qualification, but explicitly the title of the course is Counselling with Christian Distinctiveness or something like that. And I, it, it's a very Christian course. You know, they start off with like half an hour's worship and then a Bible talk and, and, that, and that kind of stuff. But they get a secular qualification out of it. And I think the, the general point I wanted to make is that everything is redeemable in this area. So um, it's possible to see a secular professional and then redeem that with maybe some other input from your church. Or likewise, it's possible to see a, a Christian counsellor, but also maybe do something more, more secular, like uh, see a psychiatrist or take medication or, or whatever it is. And I think that there's actually times, I would say, when, you know, if, if, if I'm going for an operation, I want the man with the best knife you know, if the surgeon prefers praise before the operation, bonza. That's like an extra bonus. But actually, I want the guy who cuts in the right place and has got the best infection rates and all that sort of stuff. Um, and actually, if I'm seeing a, 
a psychologist, I want the person who's best at understanding how this beast works that's got its head into my brain and understands OCD or, or whatever it is. Um, and then as long as they are, as you say, validating my worldview, not enforcing another worldview, which they should not be doing, okay, um, it's very clear in, in the guidance that you should not impose your worldview on someone. Likewise, it's okay for you to have a worldview, but it, it shouldn't be imposed. It's better you see someone good than someone who shares your faith. And the other problem with seeing someone who shares your faith is that sometimes you slip into Christianese. You know, you say things like, oh, let's give it to God, or let's pray about that, and we'll talk about it next week. And if you said that to a, a psychologist who didn't share your faith, they would say, what on earth are you doing? It's, explain to me how that works, or is that some supernatural shabba dabba do that we're never really going to... You know, what's going on when you do that? And actually, what happens quite a lot of the time is that we're actually displacing difficult emotions onto God and not dealing with them. So I think actually seeing a, seeing a secular psychologist who will call that out can actually be more powerful than seeing a, a, a bad... Christian counsellor who will gloss over those kind of things because you've slipped into Christianese. Now, a good Christian counsellor, of course, can, can do both. And um, a Christian psychiatrist can maybe do both, although my main job when I see people... And, you know, I mean, one of the funny things about what I do is, because I do the stuff on social media and the website, if our patients Google me before they come and see me, it's blatantly obvious that I'm a Christian. And occasionally that leads into great long discussions and usually what I have to say is we're not here to talk about that we're here for me to do some psychiatry so that's very interesting but we need to kind of move on and you know I'm glad that we've spoken about that but that's not really why we're why we're kind of kind of here I, th I think it goes hand in hand with what you've been saying f for a lot of the day Rob in terms of these the issues that that we might have with our mental health are so multifaceted that no one approach. I think often we're, we're, we're tempted to, to want to have a sort of all eggs in one basket approach and find the, the magic bullet. And if, if that is what you're doing, I can, I can understand that people might be anxious that kind of, if they're going to counseling, that it's also ticking the Christian box and it's also doing this and it's also doing that. But I suppose seeing that there are lots of, of, of different ways that we need to be addressing our, our mental health kind of simultaneously so secular treatment can be really good medication could be good you know seeing a, a secular counselor can, can be good as long as we're also chatting with our friend yeah. in church and we're kind of you know doing all of receiving this. healing prayer totally. breaking generational ties you know i mean there's a whole oh, I, the majority of these things are actually quite compatible yeah um and i think sometimes we, we make them incompatible when, when actually they're not yeah absolutely I think in terms of fears of turning over sort of your mind to a non-Christian counsellor, I kind of think, well, maybe it's a bit similar to our most vulnerable little minds. You know, our kids go to school where they're taught and so many of their, much of their learning and shaping of their minds is by non-Christian teachers. And some of it we're going to need to correct and bring help into. But the vast majority of it, I, you know, is technical. It's from God. It's a gift from God, I think, like education as well as medicine. So a lot of it is good. It doesn't matter that it comes from non-Christians. And I think in the same way with education, if things go a little bit awry, it's okay. It can be fixed. I think most counsellors are going to be good. We can fix it if not. Yeah, and actually one of the skills in your training counselling is how, how not to bring yourself into it. You know, So there should be an active movement against that. And I guess always, you know, we are in church communities, so you can, you, know, you can go to someone else who you think their perspective or their wisdom, either a specialty within that area or just generally be like, this is what's going on. Does this sound okay to you? It's fine. You don't need to mm. work that out all by yourself. Um, okay. Uh, we, uh, Rob, I can't find this question, but you wanted to talk about it, about um, uh, people with mental health problems repenting. Yeah. of what they should repent and what they shouldn't repent. So I basically just invite yeah. you to say what you want to say. Yeah, so what, one, of the, one of the symptoms of depression is guilt. Mm. Okay, you know, people have guilty thoughts. And it's either that they've done something extremely small wrong, like they've gone to the supermarket with ten things and they only bought nine of them. And, it, you know, they forgot the margarine. 
and it will result in all manner of sort of castigation and oh, I can't even shop correctly. And you know, so lots of sort of guilt and recrimination comes from that. Or it could be they've done absolutely nothing wrong. And they're very capable of giving advice to a friend who's in a similar situation. You've done nothing wrong. You know, you're absolutely fine here. That's, you know, it's totally fine that you were slightly shirty with, with the guy on the bus because he was being slightly shirty with you. You know, they're very good at giving that advice to other people, but very bad at giving it to themselves. So guilt is a symptom of depression, if that makes sense, it, it's, and, and of other related conditions, low self-esteem, et cetera. So, so the question is, how, therefore, do we as Christians, think, where does guilt that I need to repent of and receive forgiveness for come into that? Because the, 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 the vast majority of the time, I'm not really able to tell the two apart. I just feel guilty. And it's this sort of almost like the sort of stench of guilt. And if I haven't felt guilty for a while, well, I must be guilty because I'm a bad person. So I go hunting, hunting for the thing I've done wrong and sort of go on the, what we call the search. You know, and you sort of review and do post-mortems of the previous day. I must have done something wrong. because I, I had this sort of floating, floating sort of feeling of guilt. Um, so I think there's a, a couple of things that are, are really helpful that I wanted to share. One of them is perhaps to think about the difference between true guilt and false guilt. And there's a verse somewhere in, I think, 2 Corinthians, and it says something like, true guilt drives us to repentance and freedom. False guilt drives us to death. And, and I think... That is, to me, the test is, is this pushing you away from God or towards God? And I think most of us can think of times when we have done something wrong. We know we've done something wrong. We, we confess it to a brother or sister or we confess it to God. We repent of it. We receive forgiveness. And the, the balm of peace that draws us to God, we are drawn into his presence. We say, thank you, Lord, for I, I can be your child again. Thank you. You know, and it's, John Stock makes a helpful distinction between secret sin, personal sin, and public sin. You know, if, if all you've done is think something in your head, the only person you need to ask for forgiveness from is God. <laughs> if, if you have done something to someone else, you only need to ask forgiveness for them. You only really need to do it publicly when it's a public, public sin. And I think that distinction might be helpful, but it, it's this sort of, whereas what, what false guilt does and we have these phrases, don't we, like, you know, Satan is the accuser of the brethren or the father of lies. And what we find with false skills, it actually drives us away from God. And we say things like, um, God can forgive them, but he can't forgive me because I'm particularly bad. Or um, Jesus' death on the cross doesn't cover this because I keep doing it. Or, you know, and when we find these things that drive us away from God, I can't go to church, I can't enter into worship today because um, I'm too bad. Um, that's false guilt. And there's, there's, there's two things about false guilt. One is, don't take it to God. Because he's going to say, what are you talking about? Um, he might be nicer than that. But my point is, he says, I've forgiven you already. I, I don't have, like, extra more forgiveness or super forgiveness. Like you go, you know, you get your petrol on the forecourt, you've got standard 95, and then you've got 99. <laughs> it's like God's got 99 forgiveness for you because you need, like, more, more forgiveness. So... Uh, to a certain, obviously you can take it to God, but generally speaking, don't look for a spiritual solution to false guilt. It's more about a psychological solution and, and a social solution to that. And I think, I think the other thing is, how do we repent when we're feeling guilty? And uh, the most helpful sort of, sort of talk I ever heard on this, he said, it's, you're not repenting for things you've done wrong. What you're doing is you're saying sorry to God for times when his light was too bright and you turned away. So you're not saying sorry for things you've done. It's more about how you relate to God. And it's like, I'm sorry, Lord, that I, I couldn't see your love in those times. But I can now. So immediately you're able to sort of repent, but then you can be accepted. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, God, that I found that verse difficult for a period and I, actually, I still am, or, or thank you for, for doing that. You know, we're, 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 not, we're not saying... We're not saying sorry to God for things we've done wrong, because actually the chances are we actually haven't done anything wrong. It's, it's more sort of re repenting, perhaps, for sometimes our, you know, John Newton and some of the great hymn writers would call it, you know, our, our stubborn heart. That, that's what we're repenting over, not for the actual things we've done wrong, because probably we haven't. And I have written a book on it, 
as you were saying earlier. So, so one of our books is called The Guilt Book, and if that's your thing, The Guilt Book basically takes you through all the theology, all the psychology around guilt and, and depression from that integrated kind of perspective. And it's blue and calming. Ah, excellent. Good choice of colour. <laughs> um, obviously, Bible-believing Christians, uh, many of us, and we've heard some of those things about, you know, don't... Don't say too much, but we obviously believe in the power of Scripture uh, and its effectualness. How do we use Scripture and the Word of God and the truth of God in, in helping people? So, for example, I've heard uh, someone with depression say, um, when people would say Bible verses over me, it just felt like a crushing weight. And, and I think Sarah described a similar thing in some of our songs that are true, that she knows are true, she's like, this is killing me. I've also heard someone with OCD say, say, OCD say, I just, I, the only thing I could trust was the written word of God and God worked powerfully in that, which obviously kind of already sets the answer up a little bit, but how do we use it? I, I think um, maybe if I start with a point on how not to use it, I think sometimes if we're struggling, it can be very tempting to hit ourselves over the head with, with scripture in terms of it kind of almost using it to accuse ourselves, and, and we obviously have to remember that as, as you just said, Rob, the, the enemy, we have an enemy and he is the accuser of the brethren. And we have to remember that the enemy can use scripture too and, and, did, and did in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And so just the fact that there are some written words that are saying this thing, we just have to be very careful with that if we're in a, if we're in a bad place and it's, it's taking us into guilt or it's taking us into condemnation or it's kind of taking us into a, a place which actually contradicts other scriptures. Um, just to have, have wisdom in that, I think one thing I've often felt, I've just found really important is to not let those things become kind of obsessions in my own head. Um, I am a bit obsessive as a, as a sort of personality, and so some things can kind of go round and round. And the sooner I air that with trusted Christian brothers and sisters, the better. Um, and just try and be like, hey, I'm, can we talk about the scripture? If there's something I need to get off, off my chest. I remember as well sitting with you, Luke, and chatting with someone who was kind of really wanting to, I guess, us to talk to them about certain scriptures and I think you helpfully just zoomed out in that moment in terms of that maybe wasn't going to be the most helpful approach in the same way that you've got, you've got a weak leg because it's broken. So you don't just go to the gym to try and make your leg stronger. You know, you don't just kind of work on scripture, work on scripture, work on scripture, like and get so like involved in, in that. Sometimes you just need to kind of take a step back and just be kind to yourself and kind of just just dial things down rather than ramping them up, if that makes sense. In terms of standing back and seeing the whole of salvation history as told in the Bible, yeah. you know, it, it, it is to draw us to God and empower us. And if that particular verse is, 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 is not doing that, perhaps you say you're, you're, you're seeing that or, or, or reading that in, 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 in the wrong kind of way. And I think also something that, that Sarah touched on with the testimony is I think when, you, when you've been through the valley of death, or St. John of the Cross used to talk about the long, dark night of the soul. You actually come out the far side, you understand the Bible better. Mm. And before, you just had it like, you know, simple, simple kind of things that we could sort of trot out, um, Christian platitudes, maybe, maybe a bit more than that. But now we really get them. And now we've really wrestled with it and we've disagreed with God on stuff. And we've, we've, we've done our time on it. Um, so I think in some ways it's, it's, it's a journey that leads to, 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 to depth. Um, you know, some of our great, great, you know, people like Luther struggled with, with depression and he really wrestled, wrestled that through. And I, I know a number of people who, first of all, they're far braver than me because they're able to be brave with these suicidal thoughts and choose to stay. Or is it St. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live for me to die is gain, for then I'll be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's better for you that I remain here, at least for a while. Did Paul have a suicidal thought? I, I don't know, but he certainly had a mature understanding of what 
Christian discipleship and, and, and ministry went, whereas perhaps that's not, not how we often think about our, our faith. You know, that, that tension, that, that longing is real. And it's not a million miles away from kind of some of the stuff we've been talking about today. And I think knowing where you're at in terms of if you're struggling with something in terms of your mental health is just it's really important to kind of try and gauge where, where you're at. Like when Elijah was um, suicidal in, in the Bible, he just had this amazing triumph and, you know, he just defeated the prophets of, of Baal and, and kind of, and then he just kind of goes to pieces. Like a few verses later, runs away, says to God, I wish I was dead. And he's kind of absolutely all over the place. God doesn't come to him with sort of, theological debate immediately and like god we need to come on let's 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 get into my promises and what i've said to you again god's like sleep food mm-hmm. no you need more sleep food you know it's mm-hmm. kind of and then he's like okay now we can now we can talk and and i think that's just really important to get understand that god has that kind of perspective on us when we're struggling and isn't just like can you please just open up Romans and get into that a little bit harder? Like, try harder, do more. It's just really an important perspective, even with the Word of God, which is obviously something that leads us to life. Mm-hmm. I think this as well, just if you're the, the person giving the help, which I think as we've discussed, may be involved just by being quiet, listening, being there. I think there are, if there are things that you feel, scriptures particularly, that God puts on your heart, you really can pray that for the person don't have to do it there and then you don't have to necessarily tell it to them there and then mm. this can be a place for that but i think you can be like god i just think they need to know that that you love them in the way that this verse says you can pray that to god like jesus is you know he's there for you and there for them and so if there is i think there can be amongst some of us a very <laughs> urgent desire to say the things actually we've got prayer to we can go to god in prayer and, mm-hmm. and do that mm-hmm. that feels right can I just say a minor thing as well? On yeah. um, So a symptom of depression is uh, being unable to concentrate, uh, having a poor memory. So sometimes if you cannot concentrate, you can't read your Bible in the way that you did, you just can't remember. I mean, we all get it anyway when we're stressed a bit, but if you're really depressed, then that can be the case. Sometimes you've just got to be kind on yourself and think, okay, it's depression and it's going to look different how I find and relate to God in this time. It's a symptom. Mm-hmm. And God's cool with that. You know, I mean, we didn't have the Bible till we had the printing press, did we? Um, so, you know, I mean, it's only the last few hundred years that people have actually been able to read Scripture in the language of their hearts. So the, 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 I, think, I think there's a lot more grace in here, perhaps, than we give ourselves credit for. Um, can we speak about the role of discernment? In all of this, the spiritual gift of discernment uh, the, and, and other forms of discernment. Because I think often what we can be is, is we're, we're, we're screening, aren't we, when someone's sharing with us, we're like, what is this? And how can we know what it is? Yeah, some of us, one of the things I end up doing a lot is saying what it's not. Um, so occasionally I will see people and, you know, they'll say... I don't know, you know, they may be having some unusual perceptual experiences and they want to know if it's, if it's schizophrenia. And quite often I'll say no. And the reason I can say no confidently is because that's what I see all the time. So I know what it's not. Um, and they may say, well, what is it? And I say, well, you know, with my um, NHS hat on, I can't give you an answer to that apart from to say what it's not. But um, one of the things I, ways I sometimes get around it is I say to people, how do... How does wider society deal with, um, you know, you're, you're worried if this thing is an evil spirit or something? You know, how does, how does society deal with those kind of things? And they'll say, oh, I probably ought to go and talk to the local priest, shouldn't I? And I'll say, oh, that sounds like a good idea to me. Um, so what I can do is I, c- I can sort of direct them to spiritual help perfectly legitimately from where I am. Or also, you know, there's a bit of chopping and changing with medication sometimes. But I think there's a time to come to say we are now getting to the law of diminishing returns. There is not a medication that is going to significantly add to where you're at at the moment. Now, I know you're not better, but we need to stop looking for the silver bullet. And that requires my discernment, I suppose, in terms of training and just having done it for a long time. Um, You know, obviously, 
sort of Julia's role as, as, as GP, you know, you're probably better at the physical health side of it than me. So you might be saying, well, actually, this, this could be a bit of depression. This could be some chronic pain that perhaps we need to approach in a similar kind of way. This, actually, I'm worried about that. I need to get you a scan um, or a blood test or, or whatever it is. And it, I think, you know, going to see people who, who do know stuff, I think, can be quite helpful. And part of that, I suppose, is the spiritual gift of discernment. I mentioned that briefly when we were talking about, about, about deliverance ministry earlier, you know, the first part of deliverance ministry should be discernment. Is there something evil here that requires deliverance ministry? I would guess that the majority of the time the answer would be no. Let's just pray a prayer of blessing and move on. And if the answer is yes, we think there is deliverance required here, then We'll, we'll, we'll do that in an, in, a, in an appropriate kind of way. So I think d- discernment's got to be there in, in a number of different, different places. Likewise, you know, a good, a good counsellor might work with someone for an initial number of sessions and try and come up with what's called a, a sort of formulation, which is a sort of understanding of the problems from a psychological point of view. And that might lead to an intervention, but it might not. It, it might be actually... This is not something that you want to lift the lid on at the moment. And that's okay. You know, we don't... I mean, sometimes you watch American TV and everyone's got a therapist, haven't they? Uh, Everyone's got a therapist, everyone's got an OBGYN, everyone's got a cardiologist. And, you know, actually, it's okay just to do this a bit like layers of an onion. And you sort of approach, take a layer off periodically, maybe wait a bit, get some water under the bridge. You move on, life moves on, we get older, hopefully wiser. And then you do another layer later on. So I think, I think just trying to get good guidance and counsel around that is really important. I think it was just reflected from a church perspective when people are... I think often there can be a real pressure to have the answers, you know, in terms of, like, what's, what's going on with this person? I need to figure that out. And actually, I think one of the best things we can often say is, but I do know that I do want to encourage them to go to their GP. I do want to just simple stuff. Like mm-hmm. I do want to direct them to where they can find a bit more expert help. And I know that's a really simple thing to say, but just a really important one to, to emphasize that we, we are not called to just have all the answers and figure out the sort of right path for people all the time. Because most of the time, yeah. we're just not the expert and we don't know. Well, you, or you can, of course, you can just dig a hole in the sand and bury them while you go and get your hot dog. Yeah, um, totally. But, yeah. I mean, the, the reason I mention that again is that that's really what the Footprints poem is about, isn't it? It's about walking alongside people. Um, parakletos, the Greek for Holy Spirit, means the alongside presence of, of the Holy Spirit. He walks, along, walks alongside us. Um, and that's okay. You know, we walk alongside people. Sometimes there's answers, sometimes there's, there's not. It, the, the ups and downs of... That's normal Christian life, not, you know, everything's hunky-dory, we've got an answer. We, we like answers, don't we? Um, but maybe we need a bit more of the Psalms. Um, I think, well, uh, as a counsellor, I cannot diagnose anybody. So I'm often thinking um, from the perspective of, like, okay, so what am I seeing right in front of me? I might not know the, the answer or to put it in a certain box, but... What are the thoughts and feelings, and how's that impacting the person? Um, and how can I be a help in that sense rather than, I don't know, having a specific diagnosis that mm-hmm. you might not always be able to have? Or for various reasons, people might not be able to go to the GP or um, get a diagnosis. So, yes, I'm kind of from that perspective sometimes. Um, well, the time's almost done. Um, and also where there are loads of other questions um, and some of them are quite specific uh, uh, about certain aspects of mental health or, or, or something like that and so I've, I've tended not to ask those ones because partly I, I think Rob will deflect it and be like well that depends on the scenario and that's what the Minus Health Foundation website's for yes so you can go and ask those questions there maybe yeah mm-hmm. um, and you also he's still here he won't, he's not going to run out of the building is there a, th- is there a thing <laughs> you're going to afterwards Robert? I, I might try and catch the end of the rugby match but I think I probably missed that 
That's what I was <laughs> uh, so you, uh, if you do want to grab with us specifically, you can speak to me uh, before it goes. Uh, I'd, I'd love you to just to turn uh, to the, the people on your table, and um, we're not even going to have time to kind of reflect on anything that you found particularly helpful or, 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 or raised up. But I'd love you just to pray for one another. Uh, just pray uh, blessings of, uh, of peace and of grace and of... Uh, that God would pour his spirit into you uh, and to them, that they might then be those who give uh, his blessing and grace to other people. So uh, let's just close. We'll just do that just for a couple of moments. It doesn't need to take long, but mm -hmm. just ask God to bless you and each other.